driving on a path around the fields of the Hall Farm, it's been difficult to find where it even existed, for no marks of an entrance is visible at all. Following a small path making a dip into the woods, a pile of cinder blocks this is the first clue, which is all that remains of the dance hall, the dressing rooms, and the log cabin. Looking more closely, a small glint of water shines through the trees. To the right, a long strip of fading yellow appears in the underbrush and turns into an old sliding board lying on the ground. There you begin to make out a cement pier from another slide that is long gone. A bit further away, the tall pipe-like structures of a very high diving board tower are surrounded by pines and a crumbling cement pier It's barely visible. The earthen berms, or dam, hand dug by the scouts nearly 85 years ago gives an idea of the size of the pond and you can almost hear the splashes of water and sounds of laughter enjoyed by hundreds of people in the community for many, many happy years. The Scout Pond was, was built by the Boy Scouts as a Boy Scout project in, in early 1930s. What made it special was that it was built in the Depression. It was built as a community project. It was built by the Boy Scouts, but for the Scouts and for the town of Scotland Neck. It was there for socializing. It was there as a community center just an integral part of our community. To be able to brag about the Scout Pond for Scotland Neck is great. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful, some history there. It's a wonderful story for Scotland Neck. Um, I wish it was still here. Mr. Bracey came here, I think it was uh, 1912 that he came to Scotland Neck. He was elected mayor in 1927. But he was noticing the boys out playing in the mud in the streets and whatever. So he went and talked to the Quantis Club and uh, said, look, I want to take these boys and take, and take them out and give them something to do to get them off the street. Mr. Bracey was a saint. He kept a lot, a lot of young people he, he kept them out of jail, really, is exactly what he did. The boys were m mischievous, you know, in, in Scotland, that cut not much to do. So he, he gave them something to do with his uh, scout troop. My grandmother's only sister married a man named Jim Hall, who owned the farm in North Scotland, that north border of Scotland, that, where the scout pond was first was constructed. When Mr. Bracey got the idea of uh, having a place to go, he was looking for land, and uh, he talked to Mr. J.B. Hall. Mr. Hall let him have that at no cost whatsoever. In 1931, they went down and uh, began to build the old log cabin. That, well, I think that was the first thing that was done. And then they wanted to do something different from that, and the idea came up with the scout pond. So in 1932, they began to dig the scout pond. Uh, of course, you had no machinery whatsoever at that stage of the game, back in the early 30s. So uh, you brought your wheelbarrow and your shovels, and the farmer came in with their mule and scoops and scooped that out. They put the dam around the scout pond, up a scoop of dirt, take it up there and just lift it up. They had handles on it and just dump it and go back and get another one. And uh, this is the way it was built. I was a little bit too young to, to get in on digging the scout pond, but I did work for Mr. Bracey down there after he got it all arranged. It's hard to say my earliest memory of the sky farm because my dad says that my mother took us when we went divers. But I did uh, have classes from my mother that was a lifeguard for the sky farm for some years. 
it, it was maybe unusual for a woman to be a lifeguard, but she had to go to Richmond, Virginia to get her permit to be a lifeguard because she was a female. Everybody was real excited about the possibility of having a place to go. They had no idea how it was going to turn out, was hoping that it was going to be something. Of course, back in those days, you could do those things. Environmental folks didn't bother you. If uh, that being today, it would be a different story, but uh, it worked out very nicely. People were really excited about it. That everybody that was interested uh, in the community would take young folks to the Scott Pond and to dig and to clean and to prepare for it to be a public pond. I was baptized Scout Pond, I guess, 65 years ago. You just have on uh, pants and shirt and uh, a towel tied around your waist. And uh, there would be people all around the pond singing hymns. And uh, of course, you wave out in the water, and the preacher would baptize you in the name, you know, and then you go on, on out. Until I was 12, my mother went and sat on the sand, the beach, and we swam. And after that, my best friend Laura and I went every day, packed a sandwich, and Benjamin Harrell kept, was the manager, and he kept the sandwiches in the drink cooler for us. When we were younger, we swam and played and ate candy bars and ran around. And as we were older, we danced in the dance hall. That was the best. I was a nickel snatcher. You could swim all day for a nickel. And I had a little pouch that I would go in and collect the nickels from each person that came down. When I was about five years old, uh, I can recall going to the scout pond, which was only about less than a mile from my home. Uh, going out there in the old station wagon, all the family piled in there. Uh, uh, memories of the big sandy beach, of all the big kids having all the fun out there. We little runs before I mom's keeping us tightly under control. Uh, I recall the, uh, the, the brown water, which was no concern then because I doubt I'd ever been in but one or two swimming pools in my life at that point. Um, I remember the, the dance hall out at Scout Pond. The little kids, we weren't permitted to go in there. Uh, I do know there was a jukebox in there, but it was the big kids got to go in there and have all the fun. Scout Pond was a popular place in that day. The black people couldn't swim down there, but the white people was going in and out every day. And uh, the black people didn't have anywhere to learn how to swim. Black people just didn't go down there because they won't accept it, you know. And if they went down there, they would be asked to leave. Yeah, but you know, this is a new day. And, and that's the way it was then, and you know. I, I don't believe that a place like the Scout Bond could exist today with the with the EPA rules and, and, and environmental regulations that are placed on so many things now. I, I, I don't think it would survive today. It was around uh, 1969 or so. Uh, things were beginning to change in our town. Uh, there were court rulings coming down. There was a, 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 a school case involving um, uh, the development of a city school system here in Scotland Egg that eventually was decided by the Supreme Court in 1971. Um, and as I said, things began to change socially in the town. Uh, the Scout Pond began to integrate. Scottfield Country Club had already opened up. And the Scout Pond uh, remained open, I understand, for a few years after that. but. The cost of upkeep and everything else going on there, I suppose maybe uh, a number of people leaving there might have affected their operating budget and perhaps they couldn't keep it in good repair. I guess it was just the turning of a page in the town's history. Several of us decided that we wanted to have a Bracey Boy reunion. We, and the most satisfying, gratifying thing about all of this out of all the boys that was a member of that group, never, never had any arrest 
or any problems with the law, it's as far as we know, not a single one. And I thought that was great. It all came from the teaching of Mr. Bracey. To this day, we have people that come to town that want to go see where the Scott Farm was. They went there when they were young. Of course, all of them got gray hair, but they're still interested in it.